Marcy. There's probably people here who've heard of the Workers' World Party. That's the party that Sam Marcy started. There may even be a few people here who've heard of the uh, New Orleans Workers' Group, or Struggle La Lucha, or the Communist Workers' League of Detroit. All of them were started by followers of Sam Marcy. And if you're going to do tanky politics in the United States, hardline communist politics, you may not know it. And I think most members of the PSL don't even know his name. But this is the guy from whom most tanky groups in the United States can draw their heritage, which is quite fascinating. And it's also quite uniquely American. Uh, you don't see formations like the Workers' World Party in other countries. There are some similarities, you can say, um, but it's not exactly. It is pretty unique to the United States. Uh, I was in the Workers' World Party that Sam Marcy started for eight years, full disclosure, I guess. I joined in 2007, and I was out of the party. Wasn't exactly kicked out, wasn't exactly expelled, wasn't exactly, didn't exactly quit. It's kind of a complicated thing, but I was out of the party by 2015. I spent, you know, the bulk of my 20s organizing in his group. I never met him. He died in 1998, but I very much was connected to his life. <laughs> He's wrong. I knew him. He said this. He said that. And I, those people that are watching right now, please make a video yourself. Please, you can do a better job than I am. Talk about your history. Do a better job. Outdo me. Correct me. I want you to because I'm trying to preserve this history. That's why we're doing these classes is to preserve this history. So Sam Marcy was born in 1911 in Ukraine. He was born in a small Jewish village. Um, and one of his first memories is when he was, I guess, six or seven years old, the Red Army protected his family from the White Army. The White Army was known for their anti-Semitic purges and their, their violence. And so every time I drive by Marcy Avenue in New York, I think, well, there you go. Uh, it's kind of funny. Um, so he joined the Communist Party, uh, the Young Communist League and the Communist Party. Um, and he was organizing the Young Communist League as a teenager. Um, and he was at one point the head of the Brooklyn Young Communist League, which back then that was many thousands of people. So that was quite a rank to have. But he resigned from the Communist Party in either 1933 or 1934. Now, the official reason that Sam Marcy gives for resigning from the Communist Party was that he says, why was there no civil war against Hitler? You know, he said when Hitler took power in Germany, that was such a defeat. The German Communist Party had been the biggest party outside of the Soviet Union. Why did the communists not rise up and revolt? That was his feeling. Um, and that was a critique that a lot of Trotskyists made. The Trotskyite movement was saying that the German Social Democrats and communists should have combined to defeat Hitler. However, it's important to note that the German communists had tried that, and they'd offered an alliance with the Social Democrats. Social Democrats said no. Um, and he felt that you know, his official reason for leaving the Communist Party was why was there not a civil war to stop Hitler. However, if you talk to people who knew Sam Marcy, there was a little bit more to it than that, which is that the Communist Party, as I talked about before, was constantly trying to play up how American it was. Sam Marcy was not born in the United States. He was born in Ukraine. He was from a Jewish family. And English was not his first language. And the Communist Party was trying to play up how American it was with William Z. Foster and Earl Browder and Gus Hall. And it's very possible, and Sam Marcy had, would talk about how they kind of pushed him into the background. The majority of the Communist Party's members were immigrants. They were African American. They were immigrants. They were, they were Jewish. They were foreign born, not English speaking, but they always tried to put to the front guys who seemed like they were the most American because that seemed to be wholesome. That seemed to be the way to, to win people over. Uh, you know, when William Z. Foster moved the headquarters of the Communist Party to Chicago from New York, Sam Marcy apparently considered that to be pandering to reaction. He thought the Communist Party should have its headquarters in New York because it was more multinational. And he kind of held that against the Communist Party for his whole life, you know, that they, they had discriminated against him for being foreign born, for being Jewish, he felt. And that, was, that was a feeling of resentment that he had his entire life. Um, so he joined the Trotskyites. He joined the Socialist Workers Party, which was the main Trotskyite group. Um, but he didn't fit in with the Socialist Workers Party. Um, it's funny because the New York Socialist Workers Party, uh, that's, that's the folks that Elizabeth went over in her class uh, the other day, right? The New York City Socialist Workers Party was run by Max Schachman, Martin Aburn, and others. And it was very, very anti-communist and it was very middle class. Um, there's a documentary called Arguing the World that talks about how in the cafeteria at Brooklyn College there were two alcoves. Alcove number one was for Communist Party members and alcove number two was for Trotskyites. And that was the whole campus. They were communists of some stripe, but there was the Communist Party folks were in one alcove and the Trotskyites were in the other. And in that second alcove, 
of Trotskyites. You had Irving Kristol, eventually neo, father of neoconservatism. You had Irving Howe, who eventually started Democratic Socialists of America. You had Nathan Glazer and some others who went on to be prominent intellectuals who were definitely supporting American imperialism. Those were the folks that were running Trotskyism in New York City in the 1930s. Some other folks that recall that the, the New York City Trotskyist movement had a very weird vibe to it. Uh, for example, uh, there was someone who, from the SWP, was another Trotskyist from around the country, he went to the New York City Trotskyist uh, meeting, and the meeting was all about, what if you found out that one of your comrades had committed a class crime, like strike breaking or not following a boycott, should you turn them in and get them expelled from the party or not? And they sat around in a circle and, and pondered this question, would it be the right thing to turn them in or, or not? And that was what they talked about for like three hours. It was very, very strange, you know, kind of middle class moralistic appeal that they were making. And he never really fit in with the New York City Trotskyists because they were this middle class grouping. Um, and then in 1939, when the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed, these folks all turned against the Soviet Union and became a faction. Sam Marcy vehemently defended the Stalin-Hitler Pact, so much so that the Socialist Workers' Party actually sent him on a tour to other cities defending uh, that the fact that the Soviet Union had made this pact. And he argued that the Soviet Union, they were not presenting it in a principled way. That they should have explained that this is something that we had to do, but he felt it was necessary for the Soviet Union to make that pact. But he never really fit in in the Socialist Workers' Party, um, and so as a result of that, uh, in 1939, after, after he had been taking this position that put him at odds with the rest of the New York City Trotskyists defending the Soviet Union and their, their pact, he decided he was going to move to Buffalo, New York. And so he moved to Buffalo, New York because there was no Trotskyist group at that point in Buffalo, New York. The Communist Party had people in town, but there was no Trotskyists in, in Buffalo. So he and an actor named Vince Copeland, a Broadway actor who he'd recruited, uh, and his spouse, uh, Dorothy Ballon, they moved to Buffalo, and they set up shop in Buffalo, and they all got jobs in steel mills. Now, Sam Marcy was a lawyer at that point. He had a, a law degree, and the story goes that he worked in the steel mill and that he was so, you know, focused on politics that he almost died. He got into, like, an accident in the steel mill, and so his comrades convinced him to just work as a lawyer and not work in the steel mill. But he wanted to work in the steel mill because he thought that was more working class and more revolutionary. Um, you know, after the Second World War uh, in Buffalo, uh, they organized as the Socialist Workers' Party, and McCarthyism set in. And the Buffalo Socialist Workers' Party was different than the other wings of the Socialist Workers' Party, because the Buffalo Socialist Workers' Party was not tailing anti-communism. At the time, there was McCarthyism in the United States, and the approach of most of the Trotskyist groups was to say, oh, see, the workers hate the Stalinists. This is great, and we can show them that we're, real socialism is different than Stalinism. And, you know, there's a speech that was given by the leader of the Socialist Workers' Party, James Cannon, uh, when the National Board of the Communist Party was put on trial. He gave a speech and he said, they are absolutely guilty, but it's the wrong court and the wrong charge, and I will testify that they have never been a threat to American capitalism. They were completely cheering for the McCarthyist frame-up of the Communist Party of the United States. It was, it was horrendous. Well, the Buffalo Socialist Workers' Party didn't do that. In fact, they drove, it's a long way from Buffalo to New York City, but they drove and protested outside the trials. And they had the attitude that rather than trying to attack the, so, the, the Communist Party and go along with the McCarthyist campaign against them, the idea was whatever the Communist Party did, they were going to do it louder and more radical. That was the idea. Do it, do it in a more loud and radical way to kind of outdo the Communist Party. It was a different strategy. And Sam Marcy wrote documents about this. And his faction in the Socialist Workers' Party was called the Global Class War Tendency. And it was basically all of his followers in Buffalo, plus some people in Seattle, plus some people in Youngstown, Ohio. It was very small. It was never more than 20 or 30 people. But they had a faction called the Global Class War Tendency. And in Buffalo, during the McCarthy period, they bought a storefront. And they couldn't have a communist storefront back then. That would be illegal because of McCarthyism. So they formed something. It was called like the Mother's Committee to Support Civil Rights. It was, to, it was a storefront supporting the civil rights movement. And in Buffalo, you know, Buffalo was a very segregated town. There was the white side of town and the black side of town. Their storefront was on the road that was right down the middle between the white and black side of town. It was for the Mother's Committee. And Sam Marcy insisted that they have a pool table in the office. And his vision was that steel workers would come and play pool in the office. Well, 
that didn't really work out. It became kind of a hangout for local college radicals. There was a lot of communist books there which were not widely accessible, and it became kind of a, a hangout for local college radicals. And Sam Marcy would give classes there, et cetera. And, and they operated as the Mother's Committee, but everyone knew they were this, you know, they were Trotskyites, they were the communists. So then, in 1956, we talked about Khrushchev's secret speech that he gave, the secret speech where he, uh, he threw Stalin under the bus. Well, the reaction of most of the Trotskyites to the secret speech was to applaud it and say, see, we were right all along about Stalin. Well, Sam Marcy took a different position. He said that the secret speech actually showed that, uh, that, that the Soviet leadership was becoming less revolutionary and they were pandering to the United States. And he opposed it. And then in 1956, you had an uprising in Hungary that we now know was led by the CIA, it was to, to fight against socialism. And in fact, uh, in addition to that, um, David Irving, who's one of the leading Holocaust deniers, one of his books is called The Hungarian Tragedy. It's all about how amazing and fascist the Hungarian revolt of 1956 was. You know, so Sam Marcy has been proven correct that the 1956 events in Hungary were not coming from a good place. But the Trotskyites were saying, oh, the Hungarian workers are rising up. They want to overthrow Stalinism and have real socialism. Sam Marcy looked at it and he said, no, this is a right-wing revolt. It's being supported by American imperialism. He didn't support it. So he was on the opposite side of his party. What's also interesting is that China uh, considered supporting the Hungarian revolt, and Mao sent military people to meet with the Hungarian officers, came to the conclusion that they were anti-communists, and then China sent its military to stand with the Soviet Union against them. And that, that was the first uh, Asian military intervention in Europe since the time of Genghis Khan. It was kind of a pivotal moment that China was, instead of having foreign troops on its soil, China was sending foreign troops somewhere else. And that's considered kind of a, a great moment for the Chinese revolution. Uh, so he was on the, the opposite side of the Hungarian revolt of 1956. On top of that, at the time, you know, the civil rights movement was happening, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was marching for civil rights and, and protesting um, at that time. And... There was a lot of violence against civil rights organizers. They were being killed. So the Socialist Workers' Party, they took up the idea that in order to support the civil rights movement, they were going to have a petition campaign called Troops to the South. And they were going to call for the U.S. government to send its military to the South in order to protect the civil rights marchers. Well, Sam Marcy was a big supporter of black nationalism. In Buffalo, it's a very African-American city, and there's a lot of black nationalist groups. And Sam Marcy felt that the black nationalists were very revolutionary, people associated with the Nation of Islam, people associated with various black groups. And those folks were very opposed to the idea of troops to the South because they said the American government has always shot down and oppressed black people. And he felt that this petition campaign, Troops to the South, would alienate black revolutionaries, and it would also play into the idea that the American government is a, is a protector and, and a fighter against racism. So he opposed the Troops to the South petition. So in 1956, he disagreed over Hungary, he disagreed over, over the Troops to the South position, he disagreed over Khrushchev's secret speech, and after three years of fighting for his position in the Socialist Workers' Party, uh, they quit. And in 1959, they quit uh, the Socialist Workers' Party, and they formed a new party called the Workers' World Party. Uh, and the first issues of the Workers' World newspaper, they have done a lot to conceal them. The Workers' World Party will not publish. Uh, if you get on their website, you can see back issues going back to the 80s. They don't want you to see the 1959 issues of their paper. There's a reason for that, because they have Trotsky's face in every issue. They have Trotsky's face on the masthead, and on top of that, the first issue of the paper condemned Fidel Castro, said Fidel Castro was a bourgeois nationalist and not a revolutionary. The third issue of the paper attacked the Communist Party for supporting Fidel Castro, saying that Fidel Castro was planning a crackdown on communists and that they attacked the CPUSA for supporting Fidel Castro. They completely missed the ball on that, and they had Trotsky's face on every issue. And they were, at first, kind of a sectarian Trotskyist group that supported black nationalism. But they made an effort to try and recruit the foster wing of the CPUSA. There were some, some of the people who had been kicked out of the CPUSA over the Khrushchev secret speech stuff. Some of them were forming groups like the Provisional Organizing Committee, and eventually you had the Progressive Labor Party that was formed, and early Maoist groups. They were trying to recruit out of that, those organizations. And they really liked Mao in China. And at the time that Trotsky had died, and this is fascinating, at the time of Trotsky's death, he said that World War II could only end with a socialist revolution. And that's why, uh, if, you, if you, you know, some of these strange Trotskyist groups that really stick to everything Trotsky said, they say things like World War II is still going on. 
as Trotsky said, you could only end with the workers' revolution, right? And there are some obscure, strange Trotsky's groups that will say things like, well, World War II is still technically happening, or something like that, because Trotsky said so. Well, Sam Marcy said that the workers' revolutions that would come at the end of World War II were the Chinese revolutions, was the Korean revolution, was the, was the wave of national liberation movements that came during the Cold War. And he said, well, Trotsky was right, it's just he had the place wrong. It wouldn't be in the West, it was, it was in the developing world. And he started arguing that Mao was somehow a true Trotskyist, that even though <laughs> Mao didn't really think it, the fact that Mao had led a revolution and overthrown capitalism showed that he was more in line with Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. So Mao was a true Trotskyist, and Kim Il-sung was a true Trotskyist, and that because Mao was more radical than Khrushchev, he was calling out the Stalinist bureaucracy, and that was kind of his, his logic. So he was supporting Mao, and the Sino-Soviet split had happened, and he was admiring Mao, um, and he supported black nationalism. He thought that Malcolm X and the black liberation movement, they were the most revolutionary. So in their first years, they were known as this kind of obscure group of people, 20 or 30 people, who supported black nationalism, but had a very sectarian Trotskyist line. But they considered China to be kind of a focal point of where revolutionaries around the world were organizing, right? Because, you know, there were new communist parties emerging around the world that were aligned with China after China and the Soviet Union had their falling out. They wanted to be part of this new wave of revolutionary parties that were aligned with China. So they went to the, you know, USA and China had no diplomatic relations at the time. But there was something called the Chinese Foreign Interests Office near the United Nations in New York City. So they went to the Chinese Foreign Interests Office, and they said, we want to support you. And they said, okay, uh, bring us your newspaper, and we'll read it. And so they brought them some of the issues of their newspaper. They said, we want to read every issue of your newspaper. So they brought them some other issues, and then they finally brought them some of the first issues that had Trotsky's face on it, and they said, we don't want anything to do with you. Um, <laughs> It's kind of a funny story, but they were supporting China and positioning themselves as a, a pro-China group that was supporting black nationalism. And they came out of Trotskyism, but they increasingly started downplaying the Trotskyist aspect of their, their movement because Mao and Ho Chi Minh and eventually Fidel Castro, who they switched to start supporting, they didn't like Trotsky. So they didn't want to be known as Trotskyists, basically. Um, and so they were watering down the Trotskyism. One of the most interesting things that I think that happened in the early years of the Workers' World Party was that, that the civil rights movement, you had the historic March on Washington in 1963, where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. There were a number of different communist groups in the United States at that time. And the way that they all related to this historic event, that 1963 historic March on Washington, is interesting. So you had, you had the Communist Party, and they were involved in building the march and supporting it. But Martin Luther King Jr. and others had asked them to not be there publicly because it would be used to say that Martin Luther King was a communist. So the Communist Party hid themselves. They concealed themselves. The main Trotskyist group, the Socialist Workers Party, the way they intervened was that they had a, a newspaper, their, their newspaper, The Militant, and they had a headline calling for the, the Republicans and Democrats to be broken with and to build a freedom party. Right, uh, that would support the civil rights movement. So the headline of their newspaper was Freedom Party Now, and they were there passing out leaflets to support forming a freedom party to break with the Democratic Party. And uh, John Lewis, who had been a, a civil rights organizer, had been banned from giving a speech that was criticizing the Kennedy administration. So they republished his speech criticizing Kennedy for not supporting the civil rights movement enough, and were calling for a freedom party. What the Workers' World Party did is they got the statement from Mao Zedong that Mao had given supporting the Chinese Revolution. And they printed 20,000 copies of it. And they distributed 20,000 copies of Mao's statement supporting the Chinese Revolution with the headline, One Quarter of Humanity is on Your Side, which I think is a, a pretty effective intervention. And part of the reason that they had done that is that some of the black nationalists and black revolutionaries who joined the Workers' World Party didn't even want to go to the 1963 March on Washington because they considered, uh, they considered the civil rights movement to be completely controlled by white people, to be completely sellout and reformist. And the only way that Sam Marcy could convince some of the more radical black folks he'd gotten to recruit into his organization to even go to that march was to print out a statement by Mao. And that statement that Mao gave in support of the civil rights movement in America was written at behest of Robert F. Williams. Do folks know who Robert F. Williams was? Robert F. Williams was the leader of the NAACP of North Carolina. And his organization had been shot at. And he'd formed his own or organization, his own chapter of the National Rifle Association. And they had gotten into a shootout with the Ku Klux Klan. This is Monroe, North Carolina. 
The town where local NAACP president Robert Williams created headlines when he said, Sometimes violence must be met with violence. Many asked why. And so I recommended that, that they meet violence with violence, that uh, Negroes must be prepared to repulse attacks, that they must be willing to fight, that they must be willing to die and to kill if necessary, that uh, there was no law and no 14th Amendment uh, to the United States Constitution of equal protection in the South, and that therefore they didn't have any deterrent, so they would have to create the, the, the deterrent force themselves by meeting violence with violence. Robert F. Williams had fled to Cuba and eventually to China. And when Robert F. Williams met with Mao, he asked Mao to write this statement supporting the civil rights movement in America. So Mao did. And the Workers' World Party distributed 20,000 copies of that at the National March on Washington. And the, the Workers' World Party was also involved in raising money for Robert F. Williams. They did a lot of fundraising for Robert F. Williams. Uh, they helped to publish his writings advocating armed self-defense of the African-American community. So that was the early years of the Workers' World Party. Do we want to have a discussion of that? Um, was Sam Marcy, uh, Marcy ever critical of uh, Stalin? Because um, the way uh, his life is, like he just seemed to be more critical of the Trotsky movement than the mainline um, of Marxism-Leninism. Well, in his, his writings, he made a policy of never directi directly calling out Stalin by name. Uh, that mm. was after, after the early 60s, they made a point, even though they considered themselves to be Trotskyists, to never quote Trotsky and never attack Stalin because they felt that would alienate, you know, people that were sympathetic to the Chinese Revolution or Cuba, etc. So even though they considered themselves to be Trotskyists, they made a point of obscuring that. And up into the later years of his life, you can read a lot of pamphlets where he's clearly criticizing Stalin, he just doesn't say the name. His pamphlet on Eurocommunism, he claims that, you know, Eurocommunism is just a continuation of policies that started in 1935 from the direction of the Soviet Union. But he won't say it, and the reason he won't say it is because there was a feeling, and this, was, this is kind of the double thing that kind of infected the Workers' World Party for their whole life. They had this belief that somehow Trotskyism was counter-revolution, but they were the true Trotskyists. Like, if Trotsky were alive, he'd be in their group. And to be a true Trotskyist, you never read Trotsky, you never quote Trotsky. Uh, it was this strange double thing. They were the one true Trotskyist party in the world, and somehow to be a true Trotskyist meant you acted like a Stalinist and hung out with a lot of Stalinists. It's a very strange, strange logic. I remember uh, one of the founding members of the Workers' World Party was a woman named Deirdre Griswold. And when I was in the Workers' World Party, and when Hugo Chavez uh, came out and started waving Trotsky's writings around on television, I was so excited because I said, oh, look, this is this. And she said, actually, Caleb, that's a really bad sign. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I mean, if a, a, a leader around the world is quoting Trotsky, that's a gesture to the imperialists, that he's not a hardline <laughs> communist like, like the Soviet Union. And she was right, but then that raises the question of why were they holding on to Trotskyism? And it was a very, very kind of weird belief, right? And in the Workers' World Party, they did not have classes about Trotsky, and they did not discuss Trotsky. And it was this weird thing of like, if Trotsky were alive today, he'd agree with us, so never read Trotsky, never discuss Trotsky. And that kind of points to what I think, and we'll certainly talk about this. One of the problems of the Workers' World Party was it was very much a cult of personality. It was one man's ideology, and this man had not been in the Communist Party, and he'd been in the Trotskyist group, so this is what they believed, and they couldn't quite explain it. And that, that's a little bit of a problem that we'll get into later as this class developed. In the early 60s, you had, you know, McCarthyism was, was kind of broken, right? With the House on American Activities Committee was starting to bog down. Joe McCarthy drank himself to death. And with the rise of Kennedy, sure. Yeah, yeah. With the rise of Kennedy, you saw kind of a liberal opening on the part of, of the ruling class. There was a feeling that McCarthyism had damaged the interests of American imperialism. So because of that, there was kind of a liberal opening in the United States. And, and during that opening, you still had a strong right wing that was opposing it. And like George Lincoln Rockwell, the founder of the American Nazi Party, in the late 50s and early 60s, he started going around having public Nazi demonstrations. And George Lincoln Rockwell, you know, his father was a theater owner, and he was very much a showman. He'd, he'd been a, in the Navy during the Second World War, but he'd grown up in theater, and he would put on this Nazi costume, and he would go around with offensive signs. And, and in, a, in a weird way, George Lincoln Rockwell was a way that they could claim the United States was a free and open society while suppressing communists, right? This crazy guy in this crazy armband and uniform is walking around with signs that says six million more or something like that. 
you know, and, and that proves, look how free America is. This disgusting guy, George Lincoln Rockwell, is allowed to speak. But then when Gus Hall would want to speak for the Communist Party, they'd say, oh, he's a subversive. We can't have that. And they would parade George Lincoln Rockwell around as like proof of how open and free the U.S. society was. And that was, was one of the weird things that was going on in this time. And so the response of a lot of leftists was to beat up and attack George Lincoln Rockwell, right? And so when, when George Lincoln Rockwell was going to parade through New York City uh, in, in the early 60s, uh, the Workers' World Party formed the Anti-Fascist Youth Committee, which was a group of people that were opposing that. And they had a demonstration against it, um, and it got pretty rowdy. And actually a lot of Holocaust survivors came to the demonstration in their uniforms, just to make a statement, like, you know, um, and the demonstration was very rowdy, a lot of windows were broken, and there was such unrest that actually the police of New York City stopped George Lincoln Rockwell at the border uh, between, the, between New York and New Jersey and turned him around and he didn't come into New York City. Um, and that was a, a pretty big moment. And out of that demonstration, they formed a youth group called Youth Against War and Fascism. And that was the main way the Workers' World Party recruited in the 1960s, was they had this youth group called Youth Against War and Fascism. Um, and you can see, this is the first protest against the Vietnam War that ever happened in U.S. history. And this is the Workers' World Party in front of the White House. And look, this is not the 60s hippies. This is early, it's like 1962. These are people with short hair and glasses. Bring the GIs home now, youth against war and fascism in front of the White House. And here's also another image of youth against war and fascism. They're protesting at the New York Stock Exchange. And their sign says, stop the war in Vietnam, big firms get rich, GIs die. And that was the slogan that the Workers' World Party put forward against the Vietnam War to begin with. Big firms get rich, GIs die. And what was interesting, so, you know, you had the anti-Vietnam War movement that started to escalate. And you had the rise of it. Um, and the Workers' World Party was involved with some of the new communist groups that were coming along, the Progressive Labor Party, the Socialist Workers' Party, etc. And they were emerging, uh, and they continued to try and recruit what they considered like more radical street fighting elements. Um, I guess I'll just go over this. Um, at the time of the anti-Vietnam War movement, you had like three currents within anti-Vietnam War protests. All of the anti-Vietnam War protests were being led by some kind of communist group. Most of the people who attended were pacifists or just opposed to the war, but communists were in the leadership. The Communist Party USA, they tended to organize demonstrations that did not call for the end of the war. They called for negotiations, negotiate now. And they would call them peace parades, where they would say negotiate now. And they tended to have ministers and Democratic Party elected officials and you know, clergymen and religious folks. And, and they would say negotiate now. And these rallies, you wouldn't know communists were involved. The Communist Party would just completely conceal themselves because they didn't want to you know, get the radical attacks. So then you had the Trotskyists, the Socialist Workers Party, the SWP. They organized rallies that were peaceful, legal, and single-issue rallies. And they would say, bring the troops home from Vietnam. And they would have these huge demonstrations in New York City right, and in, in Washington, D.C., hundreds of thousands of people, bring the troops home. But they opposed any illegal actions, and they would not allow any other issues to be discussed. Um, and if you brought signs about civil rights, they'd say, that's off issue. Can you please remove that? Uh, and they were known for, for having teams of marshals. They prided themselves in their marshals that were known to get very confrontational with people. And as the Black Panthers emerged, they, were, they did not want any signs there supporting the Black Panthers. So they would see groups of people with signs supporting the Black Panthers, and they would take them from them, and there'd be like fights at these demonstrations in a lot of cases. They, they would also confiscate you know, the flag of the National Liberation Front of Vietnam. They thought that was offensive. And it was peaceful, legal, single-issue protests. And they had the national mobilization to end the war in Vietnam, the MOB, it was called. But then you had this other current of you know, what was Students for a Democratic Society, which was dominated by Maoist groups. And they would say victory to the Vietnamese, they would raise the Vietnamese flags, and they were supporting the Black Panthers. And the Workers' World Party strategically aligned itself with those forces. Um, and they would align with those forces, and you know, those forces would tended to come to the big rallies called by the SWP but they would form breakaway marches because the marshals would try to confiscate their Vietnam flags or their supporting the Black Panthers. And so they would get into fistfights with the marshals and they'd have a breakaway march that might involve some property destruction, et cetera. Um, and my understanding was that because the Socialist Workers Party were Trotskyists, a lot of times these Maoists or Workers World Party people or people that were supporting the Black Panthers, they specifically hated the SWP and the way they, the marshals were kicking them out of the parades. And so they would chant against Trotsky. They would chant, every chicken needs a pot, every ice pick needs a trot. <laughs> and they would also chant, uh, 
uh, Joe Stalin, he's no fool. He killed Trotsky. That was cool. And, and, and they would taunt the SWP like that because the SWP was trying to take their signs. But what's also interesting is as the 1960s political movement progressed, 1967, 1968, where the movements are getting very, very big, there were a lot of people who got involved in this more radical street fighting, illegal breaking windows who weren't political at all. Right? They were just kind of into the counterculture, they were just kind of into drugs, and they liked going out and breaking things. And there was a group in New York City called the Motherfuckers. That was what they were called. And it was a group of hippies who liked to go out and protest the Vietnam War, and they were called the Motherfuckers, because that was illegal. Lenny Bruce, the comedian, had been arrested for a, a joke he made on stage that said, that ended with the line, up against the wall, motherfuckers, this is a stick up. Stick up. Right? So this group, they were a group of long-haired hippie people, and the leader of them would shout, up against the wall, and then the whole group would shout, motherfuckers! You know, and they were just a group of crazy, ultra-left, you know, I mean, they, they, they didn't have politics. They were not ideological. And one of the things they would do at their demonstrations, they would chant, smoke dope, get high, all the cops are going to die. Smoke dope, get high, all the cops are going to die. And it was not political, right? And, and so you had like hardline Maoist elements that were critical of, of the SWP and the CPUSA for not being radical enough. And then you had these kind of ultra-left counterculture elements that were just kind of there to break things and use drugs and feel alienated from US society. Well, Youth Against War and Fascism, which was the youth wing of the Workers' World Party, was strategically recruiting out of this wing, of the street fighting, SDS, Maoist wing that also had these kind of, you know, I don't know what you want to call them, counterculture elements among them. And that's who they were recruiting. Um, and it's interesting because probably the most famous current that comes out of that is the Weatherman, which became the Weather Underground, right? So Students for a Democratic Society had their national convention in 1969, and the majority of the people there were part of the Progressive Labor Movement. And the Progressive Labor Movement, or the Progressive Labor Party, PLP, they, they were calling themselves Maoists, they were aligned with China, but they felt that the Black Panthers were black fascists and they didn't support the Black Panthers because they were organizing a racial organization. And they also said that the Vietnamese revolutionaries were sellouts or counter-revolutionaries. So, so progressive labor had the majority. So the faction of Students for a Democratic Society that didn't support progressive labor and didn't, you know, did support the Black Panthers and did support the Vietnamese, they broke away from SDS and they formed it was called Revolutionary Youth Movement, and they were led by Bernadine Dorr and Bill Ayers, the people who eventually became the leaders of the, the Weather Underground. And they were called the Revolutionary Youth Movement, but they published a manifesto with a line from a Bob Dylan song in it called, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows, and so they got the nickname the Weathermen or the Weather People. And they were taking control of SDS, and their position was that white workers in America are Euro settlers, uh, etc. But the hippie counterculture among the youth lays the basis for a layer of young, kind of hippie counterculture people to come to the side of the black people. Youth must take sides now, bring the war home. And their feeling was that hippie counterculture and these street fighting youth, uh, they could be like a division that would align with the black people and the Vietnamese in like a global struggle against the American empire. Uh, they'd say things like, we are the Americong, they would wave the Viet, Viet Cong flag, etc. And that was kind of their, their position. And the Workers' World Party strategically worked with those folks because they liked action. And this is a, a big part of the Workers' World Party. There's this focus on action. Sam Marcy would say things like socialism is as socialism does, meaning it's about action in the streets. It's about what the movement is doing. And a lot of the communist groups were looking at the weathermen and looking at youth against war and fascism and looking at the, the motherfuckers and groups like that that were doing all this crazy stuff and saying, this is middle class. Most working people look at these folks and say, you're dangerous. Get away from me. I don't want this in my community. But the Workers' World Party was saying, hey, they're doing stuff. This is where the action is. This is where we're going to recruit. And it was mainly about recruiting these folks. Uh, that, that was the main tactic. And that, that by about 1970, the Workers' World Party had gone from about 30 people to about 1,000. It was about 1,000 people by their 1969 conference. Um, and that was, that was you know, very significant growth. And that there was a lot of these young you know, baby boomer leftists who had, you know, had been in the streets breaking windows and smashing things and seeing that the Workers' World Party was there. And that there was also a feeling on a part of a lot of these 60s radicals that it was time to grow up, right? And that was a really common trend, that they had gotten involved when they were out breaking things in the streets, but like, now I want to do something serious. So as the 60s political upsurge was starting to wind down, a lot of these 1960s radicals joined the Communist Party USA. That's when you had the rise of Angela Davis and other figures, joined the Workers' World Party, or joined the Maoist groups. And what you call the New Communist Movement was an attempt to build a new Communist Party that would be aligned with China, right? And that the, the Weathermen, right, the Revolutionary Youth Movement, the Weathermen, 
uh, when, they, when they initially called what they called the Days of Rage, they wanted to attack Chicago. Uh, they called the Days of Rage, it was a militant street rally that was very violent and a lot of people got arrested and, and hurt. Then they called a rally in Flint, Michigan a few months later where they were supporting Charles Manson and were you know, claiming that Charles Manson was a comrade. They even had like a salute because I guess the quote is from Bernadine Dorn. Uh, Bernadine Dorn said that you know, Charles Manson had just committed his murders and she's like, he killed those pigs with the fork they were eating right on and then they all started saluting each other with forks, fork, 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 you know. So then a few months after their Flint, their Flint war conference, the weathermen disappeared. And this was a group of thousands of people, there were thousands of weathermen around the country. They disappeared, and then a few months later, there were about 20 or 30 of their members that started doing like symbolic bombings around the country. But an organization of thousands of people kind of dissolved into a group of 20 or 30 people who set off bombs here and set off bombs there. And there were many people who looked at it and said, how did they take an organization of thousands of people and turn it into an organization of, you know, like a couple dozen? Well, I mean, it was, it was kind of a retreat. But the, the sections of students for a democratic society that didn't support the weathermen. They laid the basis for something called the new communist movement. And their feeling was, we're gonna get jobs in factories, we're gonna go into working class neighborhoods, and we're gonna actually try to build a new communist party uh, that will be like what CPUSA was during the 30s. It'll be, it'll be revolutionary and it'll be aligned with China rather than aligned with the Soviet Union. Now the Workers' World Party was not part of the new communist movement because they weren't explicitly pro-China. And as China started aligning with the United States against the Soviet Union, they became more and more critical of China. They had supported Mao initially, but as China in the 1970s was aligning with the United States, they were getting closer to Cuba and other such countries. And they never said that the Soviet Union had restored capitalism. They said the Soviet Union, they felt it had a Stalinist bureaucracy that was, you know, it was conservative or whatever. But they still maintained the Soviet Union had a socialist economic basis. So I guess we can pause there and I'll get to the next part. Um, I just want to take it back to um, 1930s and talk about Anna Louise Strawn and how if she's related at all to this or if she's more international or is it? Sure. Well, Anna Louise Strong is a writer from Seattle and she was a very pivotal journalist. She moved to the Soviet Union during the 1920s and 30s and then she later uh, moved to China. She died in China. She interviewed Mao Zedong. There's quotes from her interview with Mao in the Little, in the little Red Book. Um, she wrote amazing stuff. I Change Worlds is, is, is her autobiography, The Remaking of an American, talks about very much. I mean, she's an amazing writer, and during these times, she was quite influential. Was she a part of any group in America at all? She had been a leader of the Seattle General Strike of 1919, okay. and then after that, she became kind of an independent journalist who was writing positive things about the Soviet Union and eventually about China. And during this time, you know, uh, in the 1960s, she was very much, I mean, people were reading her books. Right, her books were a big influence on the new communist movement. After Stalin died, she wrote a book called The Stalin Era, which it, it was a kind of a defense of Stalin. Not completely. She does admit there were, were problems there. It was kind of saying that what she witnessed in the 1930s in the Soviet Union was good and that Stalin had played a positive role. Um, and that book was very pivotal. Does yeah. that play a part in the hoax of the whole Demore, you know, oh, all of that? That's... Does that at all? I, what, I mean, she I wrote mean, a book called Soviets Conquer Wheat, which was right, about the collectivization okay. of agriculture. Yeah. Um, and she talked about that. And she defends Stalin around okay. the collectivization. That's in, in okay. her writing. I was, just, I was yeah. wondering if she was pro-Stalin or not. So she sounds like she pretty much was. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's called Soviets Conquer Wheat. It's her book about Soviet collectivization of agriculture. So, so Students for a Democratic Society started out as kind of a liberal organization, almost like DSA. Basically, as McCarthyism was dying down, uh, people connected with the United Auto Workers Union wanted to form like a student activist group that would be aligned with the civil rights movement. So they got a lot of funding from the United Auto Workers Union and they founded, a, they had a convention in Michigan and they started Students for a Democratic Society. And it was, you know, they wrote a statement in Port Huron, Michigan, they founded, you know, SDS and they wrote this statement that was, that was you know, everywhere, the Port Huron statement about they wanted a more radical democracy they banned any communist from joining. They were, quote, anti-Soviet, anti anti-Stalinist or whatever. But they immediately blew up. And they were on every college campus that if you were supporting the civil rights movement, if you were against the Vietnam War, that was the group to join. Um, and it reminds you a lot of DSA now. It's very similar. And actually, some of the people who started DSA also started SDS. And it was everywhere. And it was this pro-civil rights, pro-ending uh, the Vietnam War organization. And as the 60s progressed, uh, more radical elements seized control of it until it ultimately, 
by 1969, it was various Maoist communist groups that kind of taken it over and it ultimately collapsed. But SDS was a huge formation. I believe they claimed at least two million members at one point. Like it was really big and it was just the radical group on every college campus and every, every even high schools had chapters. It was just this massive left-wing activist group. Um, and at the top, it was dominated by communist elements, but most people that were in the group were not communist. Most people that were in the group were just, you know, it's like they, they were like liberals, basically. They, you know, but they were known for the radical street fighting and such, and that's, you know, and, and that's why uh, they had to have that reputation. And the Weather Underground came out of them, but very few, it was the people at the top of the group eventually formed the Weather Underground. So that's, that's SDS. In one of the earlier lectures today, um, you talked about um, Sorrell and his influence on Foster. Um, do you think there was like a Sorellian influence on the Workers' World Party? Because I kind of connected that in my head with like them being very movementist, very action-based, kind of like, get in the streets, man. Let's, you know, do this type of street fighting and let's create like a radical group of like, you know, fanatics to, you know, n not trying to appeal to like a broad mass base. Well... I think that, okay, there was not a direct Sorellian influence. You know, the Workers' World Party folks never referenced Sorrell. They don't know who he is. Sam Marcy never quotes him. Um, and they would consider, if they did know who he is, they would consider him to be dangerous. But there was an overall Sorellian influence on the new left. Franz Fanon, uh, Regis Debray, and those folks were heavily influenced by Sorrell and openly admit that, that they, they will quote Sorrell, they'll talk about that. And that the, uh, the anarchists, they talk about propaganda of the deed. Right, that's a big theme among like the situationists and, and the kind of some of the new left formations that were emerging. And the idea, it's something that Lenin himself criticized, which is this idea that you're going to go do some heroic act of left adventurism. You're going to blow something up or, and that people will see this and say, wow, and they'll go you know, rise up. And Lenin specifically says that it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. But Sorellianism kind of buys into that idea, right, that you can, you can go do something really, really radical and people will see it and be inspired. Um, and so that's a Sorellian kind of concept that, that I think was very widespread among the new left. But the, the hardline communist movement had always considered that kind of thinking to be a deviation. Um, and it's interesting because uh, the Black Panthers, uh, Huey Newton, talks about how at the beginning their armed patrols, he argues, were kind of like that because they had a psychological effect just showing that you could do it, but that they quickly moved the Panthers away from that. That was just like a propaganda thing they did at the beginning to get themselves attention, these armed patrols, but then they immediately went to start doing the free breakfast program and, and other things. And Eldridge Cleaver, Eldridge Cleaver and his faction of, of the Black Panthers wanted to continue doing this left adventurous street fighting and such. But Huey Newton and the Black Panthers, it was kind of as a propaganda gimmick, they carried around weapons and, and wore uniforms, but their main aim was to build community organizations. So there you go. I'm just curious, because I don't really know the background on the whole like Maoist and Maoism and like how that happened to the SPD. Do you, like the groups in college, did that like enhance the violent? The thing was that on the college campuses, there was a feeling that the Communist Party was too conservative because the Communist Party, you know, they had been through McCarthyism, they had been repressed, and you also had Khrushchev in the Soviet Union that was directing them to, to tone it down, basically. The fact that they were saying things like negotiate now rather than oppose the Vietnam War. There was a feeling that China, because Mao was saying revolution is the main trend and Mao was this guerrilla fighter who had a gun, a lot of the young radicals would, would gravitate toward Mao-oriented organizations because they seemed more radical and they were openly talking about communism. The Communist Party was very secretive. It was almost, it was practically an underground group. It was legal, it was functioning, but it was, they didn't, they operated, you know, it'd be someone campaigning for the local Democrats and if they thought something, they might take you aside and very carefully right, whisper you to you. have to have secret societies? Well, I mean, things had changed at this point. I mean, by the 60s, you could openly organize, but the Communist Party still was operating in this way of, you know, campaigning for the Democrats and operating in a very secretive way, saying negotiate now rather than end the war and, and kind of toning things down. They were known for that. So young people that were really excited about communism tended to kind of overlook them because they considered them to be very reformist and they were not, they weren't there. You didn't know that they were there. Um, what's also interesting, though, is that Angela Davis, that kind of changed with Angela Davis. Angela Davis was very publicly a member of the Communist Party. Um, she came back to the United States from Germany where she'd been studying. She got a job at UCLA. She was very publicly a member of the Communist Party. She was supporting the Black Panthers. She got fired. And, and for a brief moment in like 1969, 70, up until like 1972, 74, the Communist Party, because of the atmosphere, because there was so much left-wing feeling among the, the, the country at that point, they felt like they could be public to some degree or other. Um, so yeah. how does the Maoism tie, like, is that just an extreme well, sort of? Well, the Soviet Union and China had divided. Mm -hmm. And the Soviet Union was accusing China of having sell, sold out communism. Or, or, yeah, China was accusing the Soviet Union of having sold out communism. So 
Mao groups were considered to be more radical. But there, weren't, there were a lot of different groups that were trying to get China's affection. Uh, the first one was Progressive Labor Party, which is still around. Um, and then uh, later, in, over the course of the 1970s, among these radicals who got jobs in factories, they were forming different parties that were trying to get China's approval to be the official party. Uh, one was called the October League. Uh, one was called the Communist Workers' Party. One was called the, uh, the, the Revolutionary Communist Party. They're still around. And there were a lot of different groups that were trying to, the feeling was that there, we want to form something like CPUSA was in the 30s, except it'll be aligned with China this time, rather than aligned with the Soviet Union. And I hear a lot, too, that Mao like, was like, against the Maoism aspect. Well, one great example of that is when Richard Nixon went to China in 1972. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Mao met with Nixon. Um, and they had a relationship. And, and China felt Nixon was more willing to align with them because the Soviet Union they considered to be their main enemy. Whereas uh, the Maoists and leftists in the United States considered Nixon to be a fascist. He was right-winger. He was cracking down on the civil rights movement, cracking down on, on progressive organizers. So you had this weird moment where China was supporting Nixon and, and communists that were supposedly taking direction from China were trying to march for Nixon's impeachment. And it got very, very strange. Uh, one thing that, that is an example of this, this time period was uh, you know, one group, uh, you know, the Revolutionary Communist Party, which emerged, they were, they were a current that kind of claimed China but didn't follow China's foreign policy. Right? They, they claimed China as the revolutionary country, but they didn't follow their foreign policy. They formed something called the Workers' Committee to Throw the Bum Out, which was like a, a group calling for the impeachment of Nixon. But if you listen to their rhetoric, they were almost calling for like a CIA coup against Nixon. They would say things like, you know, maybe Nixon's helicopter could crash. You know, maybe he'll get lost on the way to the jump. You know, it was, it, was this, it, was, it was this, they were basically calling for the government to remove Nixon from off. They were calling for a coup, and people found that to be very odd. And then the groups that were more in with China, like the October League, they were quietly staying out of impeach Nixon because they understood that China thought Nixon was their friend. Um, so it was, it was very odd, and Chinese foreign policy started getting weirder and weirder over the course of the 70s, right? China, at first in Angola, they were aligned with the United States against the MPL, MPLA, which was the Soviet-aligned party. Then in 1973, you had Pinochet come to power in Chile, and China had friendly relations with him because he was against the Soviet Union, um, to the point that one of the Chinese-aligned parties whose members are being thrown in jail, like, sent a letter, like, you know, how dare you support Pinochet? We're your allies, and, you know, he's throwing us in jail. And ultimately, in the name of fighting the Soviet Union... China, which was claiming to be ultra-revolutionary, was aligning with U.S. imperialism. And that became an issue that a lot of these organizers who are trying to take direction from China, trying to build a communist group, are, are very confused about. Um, and one of the strengths, the reason the Workers' World Party survived, because by about 1980, most of these groups had dissolved. They didn't exist anymore. Part of the reason the Workers' World Party is still around, part of the reason they flourished in the 80s and 90s, is because even though they'd supported the Soviet Union, even though they supported China, they never were directly getting direction from them. They never took sides. They always took the position that they supported all socialist countries against the U.S. imperialists. And that enabled them to maintain enough independence that they didn't get caught up in this confusion. Uh, one of the funny stories that I heard was the October League, which was the group that did get China's approval. Like, they did actually start funding. China gave them some support financially and other things. Um, that in China, you know, Lin Biao had been like Mao's associate. And then Lin Biao allegedly tried to kill Mao. So after Lin Biao was removed, in China they had a campaign called Criticize Lin Biao, criticize Confucius. And the feeling was they were criticizing Confucius, who was the founder of Chinese civilization, and they were linking him to Lin Biao, who'd been this ally of Mao, who'd been a traitor. So in the United States, the October League had criticized Lin Biao, criticized Confucius protests in America. And the story is, I believe it was in like Portland or, or Seattle, or it was somewhere in like the North, Northwest. They had a rally against Confucius at the college where they, they took books of Confucius from the library and lit them on fire because Chairman Mao said, this is reactionary shit. It was silly, right? But they were hoping that that would prove to China that they were the real Maoists and China would back them. And, and, and again, I think this is kind of a recurring theme we're getting to here is this, this belief that we should just follow whatever some socialist country, you know, later, you know, when, when after Mao died, Albania had been aligned with China. Albania broke with China. And so Albania was claiming that they were the only true communist country in the world. And you had a number of parties that were claiming that Albania was the, and following Albania. Yeah, and it was getting, and Verhoja, and it was starting to get pretty silly, right? That, that you know, that, you know I, I think one of my strong feelings is that a socialist party, a socialist movement, while we should always oppose American imperialism, we should not become satellites or puppets of any socialist state. And doing so is to the detriment of, of mass organizations. And that, you know, yeah. yeah.
And that, you know, Cuba has oriented their followers very much to support, you know, Obama, because Obama did improve relations with Cuba. North Korea, on the other hand, has oriented their followers to support Donald Trump because Trump wants, is better on North Korea. Well, at the end of the day, we, we shouldn't be supporting Trump or Obama because Cuba or North Korea says so. We should do what is in the interest of building mass movements that oppose American imperialism right here. That's my opinion, and I think that, that needs to be said. That Confucius example is a great example of how this could get so insular. I don't think we're going to break through to my Trump uncle with uh, <laughs> down with Confucius. We'll have to explain <laughs> who. Uh, but I did. I did. I, maybe you touched on it. The Weather Underground. The leaders of the Weather Underground. Did some of them become like famous professors? Like it was oh, yeah. like forgiven. Yeah, Obama supporters. <laughs> were well, they were they feds or were they upper middle class or what was going well, on? How can you be forgiven where you want to bury Assange under the prison? I'm just confused. Yeah, Bill Ayers, um, Bill Ayers is from one of the wealthiest families in Chicago. Was it Bernadine Dorn? Uh, Bernadine Dorn is his okay. spouse. Um, and Bill Ayers, I mean, his family, they had a state monopoly. There's like a, a, a power company that has like a monopoly in Chicago. Um, it's like the, the, the electric company in Chicago. That's his, his father owned it. And so that's, he's, his family are multi, multi-millionaires many times over. Um, and he was one of the leaders of the Weather Underground. He was married to Bernadine Dorn, who was a lawyer who was also from a wealthy family, I believe. I think like her family, her, her parents were like state senators or, you know, prominent political figures. And, and they were all from very, very wealthy backgrounds. And they, they went on their bombing campaign throughout the 70s. And then, you know, in about 1979, uh, they, they, or they surrendered, right? There's a phase they were going through. I, I guess. The thing was, I guess the reason that charges were ultimately dropped against them is because the FBI had been, had broken the law so much in going after them. Bill Ayers, I guess his brother, they had hung him out of a window by his ankles and threatened to drop him if they didn't tell him where he was, and that they had broken the law in going after them. And so the Carter administration, through a back channel, sent them a mission. If you sent them a message, basically, if you turn yourselves in now, we will drop, you know, okay. and a lot of them did. Some of them didn't, though. And the ones who didn't and continued their bombing campaigns, they were called the Revolutionary Armed Task Force and the May 19th Communist Organization. And they're in, in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, and they, they did some bombings to support Peter Puerto Rican independence. There was the, the famous Brinks robbery where there was like a, a Brinks truck that was, you know, that had cash in it and they robbed it and killed a police officer and somebody else. And, and they're, you know, I think David Gilbert, they did finally just release him, you know, but he'd been in prison since many, many decades. And yeah, I mean, it was... Yeah, it's, it's a strange incident, but it's like you can almost like the world at that point from 1968 to 1972, it looked like the Soviet Union and the countries aligned with it and the Vietnamese and they were going to win. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a, so some rich kids thought, OK, well, I guess we're going to be on the winning team. But they still had contempt for average Americans. Right. They still thought average Americans were scum and irredeemable. So it's like we're going to start our little like armed group and we're going to try to recruit some hippies and we're going to do this violent thing so that when the Soviet tanks roll in, they'll make us in charge. Or so, you know, you know, it was this kind of like, that, that was kind of the mindset and it's, yeah. it's not helpful. You know, that, that's kind of my critique of, of that whole thing. So where I left off uh, before we took the break was we talked about how the political upsurge of the 1960s, the Workers' World Party was intervening and recruiting out of the militant street fighting youth that were going on at the time. And I want to then go from there to how they functioned after that upsurge ended. But before I get to that, I want to go over a couple things that are worth noting. Uh, this one is definitely worth noting, uh, Palestine. The banner says, long live the Palestine Revolution. Uh, and the Workers' World Party supported Palestine. So in 1967, you had the 67 War, in which the USA backed Israel to fight against the Arab countries. The Soviet Union supported the Arab countries in their fight uh, against, against Israel and Zionism. Um, and Israel was considered on, in leftist circles to be a topic that was not safe to discuss. And, and the Communist Party had actually been an advocate for creating Israel at the time that Israel was created in 1948. And uh, the story that, that I heard was that it was not uncommon for them to be leafleting, when they would have leaflets condemning Israel during the 67 war, for them to hand someone a leaflet on the subway about Israel or something, and for the person to start crying and break down and crying because they were having a flashback to the Holocaust. Right? Or, or, you know, it was, it was just not a safe topic to discuss. 
And there was something called the JDL, the Jewish Defense League. And the Jewish Defense League started out in Queens, New York. Uh, they were a group of, of Jewish racists who did not want black people to move into certain neighborhoods in Queens. And so when black families would move into the neighborhood, they would break the windows and beat the people up. And then when the 67 war happened, they went around beating up Arab Americans and others who protested against Israel. There were many times that Workers' World people would be out on the street with signs condemning Israel, and the JDL would show up with baseball bats and chains and just go to beat them up. Um, and it was quite an intense thing to be out on the streets of New York City promoting uh, opposition to Israel, supporting Palestine. It was quite a stand to take, but that was the position of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union recognized the Palestine Liberation Organization, uh, and the Communist Party was very reluctant. The Communist Party in Gus Hall also came out to, to support the Palestinians. Mao was on record supporting the Palestinians. The global communist movement was supporting the Palestinians, but among American Marxists and leftists, there was a huge amount of reluctance to do so. I thought I'd mention that. Um, another thing that I thought might be worth mentioning is that one of the main slogans towards the end of the political upsurge in the early 1970s that the Workers' World Party promoted was they said, stop the war against black America. And they tried to link the attacks on the Black Panther Party and the political repression and COINTELPRO with the Vietnam War. Stop the war against black America. And they'd bring banners that said that to anti-war protests and demonstrations. Um, but Another thing that's worth mentioning is during this period uh, of the political upsurge, they recruited somebody who's a rather notable individual uh, named Leslie Feinberg. And Leslie Feinberg was, is the first openly transgender activist in American history. Uh, Les Leslie Feinberg was from Buffalo, New York, um, and was working in a factory and was living undercover, essentially, as, as, a, as a man, even though uh, born female. And uh, she saw the demonstrations going on, uh, and she saw Youth Against War and Fascism protests happening, and she joined the protests, and then had, uh, started openly talking about being transgender, and then the Workers' World pa Party published a pamphlet she wrote called The Diary of the Transsexual, uh, which is considered one of the first like pamphlets ever to advocate transgender rights, and Leslie Feinberg became this kind of definitive person in the LGBT movement, and she was also a follower of Sam Marcy. And you know, since I just want to briefly mention her, I did get to meet her a little bit when I was in the Workers' World Party in like 2007, 2008. And what uh, I thought was interesting was that was the final years of her political activity. She caught Lyme disease and eventually died from Lyme disease. The last five or six years of her life, she wasn't politically active. But in the final years that I knew her, she was in this obsessive mode about the use of the LGBT movement by American imperialism. In Cleveland State University in 2007, I had just joined the Workers' World Party, and they said, oh, Comrade Leslie is going to be speaking. So we went to Cleveland State University, and the LGBT Studies Department of Cleveland State University had hired her to give a talk about trans rights. And she got up to the podium, and the whole speech was about why Cuba is amazing and why trans activists and LGBT people should support Cuba. Uh, also, uh, she was also a very big supporter of Iran. And at the time, you know, there was this, this, this image. I remember at my college, uh, they put up a poster, and it had two, two men being hung. And it said, uh, you know, the reason Ahmadinejad says there's no gays in Iran is because he killed them all. Well, actually, Leslie Feinberg wrote an article exposing that and said those two men were not hung for being gay. They were hung for raping a 13-year-old boy at knife point, and that this was propaganda. And pinkwashing of imperialism became her obsession. And these universities didn't particularly like it. Uh, they would invite her to give a talk about trans stuff, and the talk would go to why you should support Cuba, why you should support North Korea, why you should support Iran. And, uh, you know, I, it was pretty heroic that she did that. Uh, one thing that she also did was during the AIDS crisis, uh, you know, Cuba was quarantining AIDS victims because at the time there was a lot of information about not knowing, you know, the AIDS virus and what was going on. And a lot of anti-imperialist and socialist countries like Iraq and other countries were quarantining AIDS victims. And so the LGBT movement started having anti-Cuba demonstrations saying they're quarantining AIDS victims. And Leslie Feinberg went to those demonstrations and disrupted them and got up and screamed that you're supporting American imperialism, leave the Cubans alone. And so, you know, it's, it's interesting to see that now transgender issues are one of the main things that they use to attack different yes. countries and different left groups. Yes. But the, the, the first openly transgender activist was herself horrified by that and spent the final years of her life opposing that. And she was part of the, the Workers' World Party of San Marcy, which I think is worth mentioning as well.
1974, the political upsurge in the 1960s, from about 1968, 1969, 1970, 1972, it, it had started to take a downturn. You didn't have huge anti-war protests anymore. There weren't huge rebellions going on among the black community, you know, uh, like there had been, you know, after Martin Luther King Jr. was killed, you had every major city in the United States go up in flames of rebellion. Uh, you had the huge student movement, Columbia University being shut down, and that wasn't happening anymore. And so at that point, uh, the Workers' World Party decided to reorient themselves. And Sam Marcy, basically, he took the position that they should do what they called a face to the masses, meaning that they should go to average Americans and organize them around an economic program. And they built something called the Center for United Labor Action. But there was a problem, which was that, first of all, it was very difficult to do it because the U.S. economy was still very strong. And while there had been some radical sentiments on the college campuses and among the black community, among the broad masses of Americans, there was a feeling that they were supporting Nixon and these kids need to all, you know, get a haircut and, you know, you know, get a job and they weren't supporting that. So the Workers' World Party had it in their minds that they were going to reorient toward recruiting the broad masses of people, but they had it in their minds that the way to do this was to completely conceal the party. Right? And organized, they organized campaigns around food prices. They organized campaigns uh, around uh, you know, labor unions and community support for labor unions. But they did it in a very secretive way and uh, around veterans' benefits. They had a national protest demanding veterans' benefits for Vietnam veterans. And they were, they were trying to you know, build some kind of economic organization. But for the most part, the broad masses of Americans didn't want to hear it. And this is kind of the tragedy of the new communist movement of the 70s, is these folks in many different groups, the Workers' World Party, the various Maoist formations, they were all doing what you're supposed to do. They were going to the masses. They understood that the hippie counterculture wasn't going to make a revolution, and they tried to go to the masses. But the economy was still strong, and on top of that, China's politics were shifting, and the world was changing, um, and we were entering the late Cold War. And a lot of communist groups had this experience of working in a factory, trying to sell their co-workers Mao's Little Red Book or something like that, and them not wanting to hear it and just kind of being rejected by it. Um, I've often talked about how um, around 1978, 1979, uh, you saw a big economic downturn, and then some of these groups started acting crazy because they'd been doing it for so many years and not getting any results. And so as uh, you know, they, they went and did some crazy stuff during that period that we'll talk about in the next class. But, but a lot of the communist groups had this frustration. But then something happened in 1974 in the city of Boston. Where they were integrating the schools, right? They had school busing you know, because there were white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, in order to bring equality in education, they started busing children to different schools. And the conservatives in the right wing jumped on this. Um, and there were anti-busing riots that happened, uh, where some school buses were blown up, and mobs of white people would be waiting for the bus to come from the black community and throw things at the black students. And there was kind of this racist mobilization against busing. Um, and so the Workers' World Party, they organized a march in 1974 called We Say No to Racism. And it was the first time that the Workers' World Party had done like a national protest, not in their own name. Whenever they, they didn't organize national protests. They would go to the national protests called by the Socialist Workers' Party. They would go to them and have the breakaway marches that smashed windows and waved the Vietnamese flag. Or when they'd marched against the Vietnam War in the early 60s, these small rallies were done in their own name as their organization. However, this was the first time they had a national protest in which they concealed themselves. And they had Democrats speak at the rally, elected Democratic Party officials. And they called the march, We Say No to Racism, because they didn't want to attack black nationalists who opposed busing. There were many black nationalists who didn't believe in busing. They didn't want integrated schools. They just wanted better schools in the black community. And so it was a weird moment where there's these riots going on against busing, where black children are being attacked for trying to go to white schools. How do you react to it? And the left kind of had different ways of reaction. The Communist Party supported busing 100%. They called the anti-busing riots fascist. They said, you have to vote for the Democrats because there's fascism coming from the Republicans. The Socialist Workers Party also supported busing. They said, busing is the answer. The, the Maoist groups took some interesting positions. The October League, they would not say they opposed busing, but they made a point of supporting black nationalist groups who opposed busing. So in their newspaper, they would publish articles from black nationalists who didn't believe in busing. Um, and the Revolutionary Communist Party actually supported the racist riots. Um, and they, they published uh, an issue of their paper. The, the front page was uh, mobilize, unite the working class to smash busing. And they had it in their mind that because these riots that were happening were working class people, uh, that this was, this was somehow, and that, that communism was the answer, not busing. Um, and uh, that was, they were supporting those riots. So 
The Workers World Party, they organized this huge rally. It was about 20,000 people that marched through Boston. Um, and that was a moment where they were looking at these other groups and saying that, oh, the Revolutionary Communist Party, they're supporting the racists. Oh, the October League, they're supporting the racists. And they took this as kind of a weird moment where in their minds that meant we should always never do anything that could be quote unquote right wing. Uh, during this time in 1974, around the same time, there were the textbook riots in West Virginia. In West Virginia, uh, the school textbooks were teaching Darwin's theory of evolution. And a lot of the local fundamentalist Christians didn't agree with that. Uh, there were some, some bombings and some protests by evangelical Christians in West Virginia who felt this was a kind of, they didn't want their kids learning evolution in school. And the Revolutionary Communist Party took the position, well, this is working class people. This is about their control of their schools. They supported it. Of course, the Workers' World Party opposed it. But it was a weird moment where you started seeing protests coming from the right. And that confused these you know, people who'd been involved in all the left-wing protests in the 1960s and the political upsurge. And they didn't quite know how to respond to it. And it's important to talk about what was going on because busing, it wasn't like the, the capitalists and the bosses just said, oh, we just want you know, low-income African-American children to have more opportunities. There was an element of pushing austerity, right? And that they did realize that some of these urban Roman Catholic communities were very much a barrier to austerity. In urban centers at this time, you had African-American communities, and then it was very segregated, and you had white communities. But those white communities tended to be Roman Catholic. They tended to be you know, Polish or Irish or Italian. And that tended to be where a lot of the cops and firemen came from. And those folks, while they were very racist usually, they were also very opposed to austerity. And the Ford Foundation and other groups were funding protests supporting busing, not because they cared about black people, but because they saw this layer of, of urban you know, cops and firemen that were Roman Catholic that were, you know, they saw them as a layer. And a part about bringing in austerity and rolling back the social programs was, you know, they saw busing as kind of a vehicle to do it. So it was a very complicated situation. But that was a situation where the Workers' World Party folks, in their minds, well, we never support the right wing. They built their huge mobilization against busing. They concealed their communist politics, and they let Democrats speak at their rally, and they considered it to be a huge success. And over the course of the 1970s, uh, you started seeing this kind of thing start to happen. The orientation that Sam Marcy gave the, the group was that we want to take control of the movement, right? That what was left of the 1960s political upsurge, folks who marched against wars, folks who marched against racism, they're the movement, right? That's, you talk to old 60s rattle, the movement, brother, what's the movement doing? You know, and their orientation was to take over the movement. And they had quite a bit of success with this because the movement was in decline, right? The movement had been a really big deal in 1968 to 1972, but by 74 and 75, the movement was in decline. So a well-organized group of well-disciplined Marxist-Leninists could effectively maneuver to get into leadership positions. In 1981, the Workers' World Party organized the People's Anti-War Mobilization, or PAM, which was the biggest anti-war protest since the 1960s. Uh, about 100,000 people came out you know, to march. It was a People's March against Reagan, the People's March against the Pentagon that they marched. It was an anti-war rally. And because the Workers' World Party was stepping up into leadership, it had a bit of a different character. It had been the Socialist Workers' Party that had been organizing the big anti-war protests. However, the Socialist Workers' Party sued the FBI. And they, they took the FBI to court for infiltrating them. COINTELPRO was being revealed in the 1970s. The, the church committee of Congress was revealing that the SWP had been infiltrated. So they sued the FBI. And the lawsuit against the FBI, which they won, and the FBI paid them lots of mo money and reparations, the lawsuit against the FBI by the Socialist Workers' Party destroyed the Socialist Workers' Party. At one point, the FBI said in court that, there were, that one in three members of the Socialist Workers' Party had been FBI informants. They weren't. It wasn't. That was a lie. It was, like, it was much lower than that. It was like 1 in 10, maybe 1 in 20. But saying that introduced a huge amount of suspicion into the organization where everyone thinks everyone else is a cop. And that was a way of kind of destroying the group. And over the course, in reaction to their lawsuit against the FBI, the proceedings around it, the group started falling apart. And by about 1980, the Socialist Workers' Party was down to much smaller than what it had been. And that created room for the Workers' World Party to step up and start leading these anti-war rallies. And what's interesting is the Socialist Workers' Party, as I'd mentioned before, their, their approach was they said peaceful, legal, and single issue. Well, people joke that the Workers' World Party, they said peaceful, legal, multi-issue, right? Because their anti-war protests would include Palestinian speakers and LGBT speakers and Puerto Rican independence activists. And the orientation was kind of if they can reserve the permits and they can set up the stage, 
uh, they can get a lot of old movement people to come to a rally that's much more radical than the politics those people would be willing to accept. That was kind of the idea. And so, you know, the, the 1981 People's March on the Pentagon, the People's Anti-War Mobilization, uh, it was the first rally with an openly LGBT speaker, the first national anti-war protest, the first national anti-war protest with a uh, Palestinian speaker, uh, with, a, with an LGBT speaker, with, I mean, they were very much, they were supporting North Korea, etc. And a lot of people who wouldn't agree to those politics necessarily, but wanted to keep the momentum of the 1960s going, would go to the rally. And so they were taking over the movement, which was kind of their, their, um, their thing. Um, and so that became kind of their orientation. And they formed a lot of different coalitions and movements, or and coalitions and groups that would be trying to take over the movement. In Detroit, they had something called the All People's Congress. It was this gathering that they had where they invited a lot of different labor unions and black liberation activists. And it was all run by them. You know, they had reserved the building. Sam Marcy got to give a speech for like an hour at the event. And it was like the idea was we're at the center of the movement. We're, mo we're building a movement center. That was their orientation. Um, but... I guess, I guess we can break and have a, we'll have a conversation here if people want to react to that. Um, what was the aspect of busing that would, um, when they were reacting against um, stable Roman Catholic communities that were against austerity, what was the way that um, busing would beat that down? Is it to just break them up physically or? It was to, to break apart the neighborhoods where there was kind of a strength, you know, that if, in, an, in, an, in an Italian neighborhood where they've all lived together and they're all speaking in some cases Italian or, or they've all lived together, they all go to the same churches, they have an ability to block austerity, to kind of come together as a community and block austerity. And there was a feeling on the part of the Ford Foundation and others that that was a barrier to, you know, the power of these big banks and big institutions, right? And those neighborhoods were very much, you know, there was a feeling we don't want black people in our neighborhoods. It was a racist mobilization, and there was a huge amount of racism, and we don't want to gloss over the hate crimes that were being committed. But the capitalists were supporting the pro-busing protests for their own reasons, and that's important to note as well. And, and again, you have to have a conversation about these things, right? You know, it's George Soros doesn't fund protests because he's just, he's secretly a socialist deep down, right? And that, that there, there didn't seem to be a conversation about those kinds of issues in the Workers' World Party. It seemed to be, there's the right wing and they're bad, and then there's us and we're good. And they kind of missed that, that there are divisions in the ruling class. And strategically organizing around those divisions is very important. I do think it's really interesting how just kind of the main prevailing opinion now, um, as it has been for a long time, is that uh, busing is the solution to racism. Like this was the, they, you know, get black kids into white schools, racism will be solved, it will disappear. Obviously this has not happened, um, but um, I think it's really interesting how that is the perception that was created. Um, and uh, if you oppose that, you're racist. Well, I mean, black nationalists, you know, I, I, <laughs> they are what they are. So I, I just thought that was really interesting how, how that is. Uh, and uh, I was, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and that's, I, I should just mention this now. That's one of the things that, that was, when they were in their better days, they were strategic in that they didn't say, Pro, the march wasn't a march for busing. It was a march against racism because they knew that there were a lot of black nationalists who didn't support busing. And that if they called it a march for busing, that would be perceived as, an, as a group of white people telling black people they needed to go to white schools when there was a large percentage, not a majority. The majority of the black community did support busing at that point, but there was a large percentage of the black community that didn't. And so they strategically called it, you know, we say no to racism, right? Which was showed that there was nuance and sophistication to their approach, much more nuance than they've showed in more recent years. So, yeah. Uh, and, and it's worth noting also that the anti-nuclear movement got going during this time. And Sam Marcy always insisted that the Workers' World Party never say that they oppose nuclear power. He said that we are for workers' control of nuclear power. But he never said that they oppose nuclear power because he said there's nothing inherently wrong with nuclear power. The idea, oh, you can't split an atom, you're playing God, that's not Marxism. That's religious thinking, right? Yeah. However, they saw, and, and we'll get into this a little bit later, they saw the protests against nuclear power as protests against the Pentagon and they, therefore, they made a point of joining them, even though 
even though what the movement was promoting against nuclear power was something that they realized was not correct. So in the 1980s, the protests against nuclear power kind of combined with protests uh, against war. The anti-war movement came, became kind of you know, overwhelmed by the anti-nuclear movement, which was funded by big oil. Big oil doesn't like nuclear power because it will put them out of business. And Rockefeller think tanks and the Ford Foundation, a lot of these groups were funding anti-nuclear protests. And a lot of the old anti-war folks from the 1960s were getting involved in that. They said, we don't want a nuclear war, and we also don't want nuclear power. And that became combined. And that became kind of a, a layer in US politics, as you had these kind of hippie kind of folks who were supporting the Democratic Party. They said, if Reagan gets reelected, we're going to have nuclear war. Reagan is a fascist. He's a warmonger. And we're against nuclear power, and we're against nuclear weapons. And that was an axis. And there seemed to be an understanding on the part of the Workers' World Party's leadership that there was something problematic about this axis. Um, but the Soviet Union oriented its allies to support this kind of stuff. And the reason they, they oriented them that is because the military-industrial complex was the most direct financial threat to the Soviet Union. In the United States, militarism and weapons is a way to make lots of money for military contractors. In the Soviet Union, it's a huge drain. And they realized that you know, making the Soviet Union run up their budget and, and spend lots of money on having to build a new nuclear missile. Uh, Michael Parenti talks about how it wasn't an arms race, it was an arms catch up. The USA would make a, a bigger missile and then they'd have to catch up and do another one. And, then they'd have, and that, that was a way to hurt the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union felt the financial pain of having to spend a lot of money on nuclear weapons and weapons, et cetera. And so the Soviet Union oriented their allies to focus on fighting Reagan and the military industrial complex. But even within the Workers' World Party, there was an understanding, there was a feeling that something wasn't right about these mobilizations. They were the ones leading these mobilizations, but they knew that a lot of the people going to these protests were not where they were at, right? And so Sam Marcy, he wrote a book called Bolsheviks in War, and he, he tried to orient the anti-war movement to take on a more working class character, which is interesting. He wrote, these giant multinational monopolies are more powerful than any ancient empire ever was. There are even few modern imperialist states that can rival the power of one of the dynamic finance capitalist groupings which bankroll the, the weapons systems. They relentlessly milk the U.S. Treasury, which in turn passes on the losses to the masses of the working class and oppressed. If the struggle against imperialist war is to become serious, it must take on a working class character. That doesn't mean to narrow the appeal, as capitalist politicians maintain. On the contrary, it means to broaden it for the working class and the oppressed people together with a lower middle class strata that constitute the majority in any case. Taking on a working class character means that the fundamental aim of the anti-war struggle is not merely against the military industrial complex, but also the defense contractors and the big banks, as well as the giant oil corporations. In a word, the struggle against imperialist war must be conducted on an all-around class-wide struggle against the bourgeoisie. And so, He's realizing that this anti-war movement that basically his group is stepping up to kind of take control of is dominated by politics that are not really their own. They're, these are politics that are different than what the Workers' World Party wants, but it's what they can do, right? Uh, there's a political reaction going on in the country. You know, Marxism and socialism are not popular anymore. The political upsurge is over. This is what they can do, is they can be the stage managers of the anti-war movement. And it's worth noting the people that went on to start PSL they're people that flourished in this period. Brian Becker was one of the main organizers of the People's Anti-War Mobilization, and he learned the art of reserving the permits and setting up the stage, and that's what the Answer Coalition that emerged during the Iraq War protests and PSL, that's where they come out of. Is they, were, they were Sam Marcy's staff of people that organized these protests, and Sarah Flounders and others, this is their background. They were the ones reserving the permits and setting up the stages for these big anti-war Then you have the fall of the Soviet Union. And the fall of the Soviet Union Pretty much, people say it killed Sam Marcy. He had oriented his followers like nothing like that could ever happen. Right? There had always been an understanding that the Soviet Union, despite its problems, was a solid foundation of working class power. And something like that could never happen. And uh, they did make a point of opposing all the color revolutions. And they defended the, the arrest of Gorbachev, the, the so-called coup, and they defended the Soviet Union. Um, but it was, they were on the losing side. And, the socialist countries were all collapsing and falling apart. And uh, people kind of laughed about Sam Marcy because even in the final years, like as late as 1994, 95, he was saying it's not over yet. It's still not over. And well, it was over. The Soviet Union fell. But he was insisting it wasn't over yet. And after the fall of the Soviet Union, you have Sam Marcy diverting back to Trotskyism, basically. And he wrote a pamphlet called Soviet Socialism, Utopian or Scientific, 
comparing the Soviet Union to the utopian communes that, that Frederick Engels had written about. And he said, why did New Harmony disintegrate? The common explanation given by bourgeois critics of these rugged early communist experiments is that they failed to reward personal initiative or rugged individualism for which the capitalists and imperialists are so famous. However, the more important reason for their failure which they were, was that they were in competition with the capitalist mode of production and dependent on it for the purchase and sale of materials. Even the Rappites, who were quite prosperous, had to move their communal society to Indiana, to Pittsburgh, to be near the market. Communism as an idea has existed for centuries. Communist societies like New Harmony and New Lanark, hundreds of others, were not an accident of history, but a response to the meanness, inequality, and poverty of class society. Now that counter-revolution is fully in the saddle of the Soviet Union, and the wrecking crews are breaking down every progressive and revolutionary for reform, shall we say that this too was a form of utopianism? Was it not an attempt to build an oasis within world imperialist environment like that of New Harmony? Um, um, the socialist revolution unexpectedly broke out first in Russia, not in an advanced capitalist country. The USSR was a too large, to a large extent, an isolated phenomenon in a world still dominated by capitalism. Although it covered one-sixth of the Earth's surface, it was surrounded by an imperialist, uh, a world imperialist environment. The Bolsheviks had a revolutionary and scientific approach to building socialism, but they were no more immune to the social environment, to the domination of monopoly capitalism on a world scale, than New Harmony was in its day. So basically he's declaring that the, the argument, he's diverting back to Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution, which is until you have a revolution in the West, nothing matters, right? The West is always going to remain the center of the world. Leon Trotsky said that New York City is the foundry where the fate of mankind is going to be forged. And so the Soviet Union was doomed from the beginning because communism never spread to the West. Well, if you look at what's going on in the world today, it's clearly he was wrong. The world is not centered around the West. And, you know, he maintained, up until his death, he maintained friendly relations. Here he is with Fidel Castro. You know, maintained friendly relations with the socialist countries. Here's Fidel Castro, Sam Marcy in 1993, they met. Here he is with Kim Il-sung. Uh, that's Sam Marcy and there's Kim Il-sung. And they maintained a relationship with the socialist countries. But there was a feeling that uh, unless you have a revolution in the Western capitalist countries, uh, that there is no hope for, for anything in the world. And if you look at what's happening in the world today, Russia and China are rising, and in the West, we're disintegrating. We're clearly disintegrating. And I don't think the choice before us is, is the rest of the world. I sat through many workshops when I was in the Workers' World Party that said, you know, we would, we would hear about the struggle of Nelson Mandela against apartheid. We'd hear about the Irish freedom struggle. We'd hear about what Cuba's going through. And they would say, the workers around the world are waiting for the Americans to move. No, they're not. They're not waiting for the Americans to move. No, they're not. What's happening is they are moving. And Russia and China are rising, and Iran is rising, and Venezuela and the Bolivarian countries are rising, and a new economy is emerging, and Western financial capitalism is collapsing. However, the question is, what will come after the collapse? Will we get to a higher plane? Will something emerge in the United States that is aligned with this new alternative economy? Or will we deteriorate like the Roman Empire? Will we collapse into barbarism and chaos? And that's the question facing the US society. It's very clear the West is not going to remain the center of the world. However, the rest of the world isn't waiting on us to move. And our job here is not to tear it down from within. It's tearing itself down. And so this orientation that they had was not correct. And this is the ultimate flaw in Marxism. Marxism maintained this kind of destructive mindset based on the belief that the West is always going to be the center. We're the good Americans at the center of the evil empire. You know, we're just like the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the underground resistance in Nazi Germany. And, and that is in itself an anti-populist mindset. But Marcy knew better to some degree. And that shows that this is complicated. These are revolutionaries trying to do the best they can in complicated historical circumstances. And that's why I wanted to end this class by having us read a, a document I gave you all. David Duke, the... Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, white supremacist, was running for governor of Louisiana. And that was a disaster. This was in the early 90s. So Sam Marcy wrote a letter to the workers of Louisiana urging them not to vote for David Duke and telling them they shouldn't vote for David Duke. Listen to the language he uses because this is somebody who knew how to speak. This is somebody who understood how to make arguments. He went back to his 1930s broad masses of people organizing. This is how he chose to speak to the workers of Louisiana to convince them not to vote for David Duke. So why don't, uh, you know, uh, do, do you want to go first, Gavin, then Tristan, and, and then just, just keep going? <laughs>
I just thought it might be worth doing. And, and here's the mic. We can read it as a group. So. How important is that? Just paragraph by paragraph, yeah. If you are one of the million or so workers in Louisiana, you may be thinking of voting for David Duke in Saturday's gubernatorial election. As a worker, you have much to think about these days. Almost everybody agrees these are hard times. Some people say that the depression now hitting this country began 10 years ago in Louisiana. As a worker, you are concerned with your own livelihood and standard of living. If you have a family or dependents, you surely are concerned about them. You might have received a letter from your employer urging you to vote against Duke. Quite a few companies have been sending such letters to their workers. Stewart Enterprises, the Lamar Corporation, we don't know who else, uh, but Business Week magazine of November 18th says many. It is a violation of the Constitution and labor relations law to tell workers how to vote, either in union elections or in political campaigns. Of course, many workers who know the anti-labor record of the companies they vote they work for are suspicious when their bosses suddenly go on a media campaign against Duke. Where have they been all this time? Why right now? The way they're talking now, you would think the gas and oil would evaporate and the Mississippi River dry up if Duke's elected. However, these bosses might just as quickly change their minds the day after the election and embrace Duke in the same way that the German industrialists and bankers supported Hitler. These are questions we have to keep in mind when these bosses, and some of the most greedy when it comes to wages and working conditions, suddenly become knights in shining armor urging us to do battle. Whatever their motives may be, it has nothing to do with our own interests as workers. Every worker ought to question their motivation. It has always been how to get profit out of their enterprises by taking our labor and giving us, in return, as little as possible. So let's not speculate on what their motives may be. Let's examine David Duke independently of what they say and consider his candidacy from the point of view of our class interests as workers. <coughs> David Duke has been a state representative long enough that he should have been able to clearly and simply address the burning issues facing Louisiana. These are joblessness, health care for the hundreds of thousands who have none, and the growing poverty, which is a 20% above the national level. Page two, rich state, poor, poor people. Yet he has introduced no bill, made no speeches, nor raised as much as a whisper in connection with these very profound issues. Rich state, poor people. David Duke has avoided addressing the most important question of all. That is, why should this state, which is so rich in natural resources, have so many poor people? And why should you, as a worker, have to worry about your job? Louisiana is not poor. It has one of the greatest natural resources in the world, oil. It also has another important source of energy, natural gas. It has a big petrochemical industry. Its fertile soil provides a rich variety of agricultural products that are shipped to all parts of the world. Its forests yield lumber and paper products. Off the coast are rich fishing areas. So why is life becoming more and more difficult? Consider one thing which Duke never seems to mention. Whether you make your living as a wage worker or as a professional, your income level is lower than that for comparable work in almost all of the northern, eastern, and central states of the United States. If you are a public school teacher in Louisiana, you earned an average of $21,280 in 1987 but a teacher in New York State got $32,620 in that same year. Wages have gone up a bit since 1987, but the differential is still about the same. That's a fact, and facts are stubborn things. This kind of 
differential in pay between Louisiana and other states holds true not only for teachers or other professionals, but for all workers. Some may say, and properly so, that wages in Louisiana are better than in Mississippi, Arkansas, or other states of the old Confederacy. But that only helps to make the most important point. Why should the southern states have lower wages than the rest of the U.S.? It's not because of geography. It's history that makes the difference. Jefferson and slavery. Take the case of Louisiana, which became a state in 1812, nine years after it was purchased from France during the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was considered one of the most enlightened people of his day, especially in France where he served as the U.S. representative. He was a writer and a thinker, a scientist and statesman, and the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence with its famous line about, quote, all men are created equal, unquote. Yet Jefferson, as president of the United States, purchased the vast Louisiana territory, which had been the home of native people for thousands of years. And instead of taking an enlightened and democratic approach to this territory, Jefferson, a slave owner, a slaveholder himself, was most interested in extending slavery there. Many people think that the mass of the whites were made better off by the enslavement of black people, but this isn't true. The enslavement of a great numbers of black the enslavement of great numbers of black people made a few whites rich and powerful, but the white workers never got anything from slavery to benefit them historically. Far from being lifted above the ordinary workers in Detroit, Cleveland, Los Angeles, or Philadelphia, the white workers in the South lagged behind the rest of the country. The idea that white workers were helped by slavery is a myth. Of course, there may be some sick psychological satisfaction in being free while others are forced into involuntary servitude. But the upshot of it is that the standard of living of workers in the former states of the Confederacy has never come close to that of workers in the northern, central, and western states. Today, more than 125 years after the bloody Civil War, which cost the lives of so many people and finally resulted in the abolition of slavery, workers in Louisiana must still grapple with this problem. Who's Duke against? Now comes David Duke, who is running not just against Edwards, but against the black people. That is what is firmly implanted in the minds of the electorate as Saturday approaches. But that is not the whole truth. What he carefully conceals is that he is running against the working class as a whole, black and white. Duke's slick and well-publicized campaign shows that he's not just an individual. Who's behind him? At first, he said he was for the little people. Now he claims he has letters of support from some of the biggest monopolies, the billionaires, although that has yet to be proven. It is known for sure, however, that he gets a lot of money from millionaires on the far right. Don't forget, a billionaire has a thousand times as much as a millionaire. But either way, he is proving himself very useful to the big monopolies. This is a town where mass anger could very easily focus on the big corporations and banks as they throw workers into the streets and the economy goes into tailspin. Duke is helping big business by diverting attention away from those responsible for the economic disaster and blaming everything on the poorest people. You have heard that Duke used to openly praise Hitler and was selling Nazi literature from his office just two years ago. Hitler, too, directed the anger and fear caused by the 1930s depression away from the biggest bankers and industrialists. He organized a movement that destroyed the progressive and labor movement in Germany using racist oratory to whip people up. But like Duke, at the beginning of his career, Hitler tried to look anti-establishment. He talked against the international bankers claiming they were part of the so-called Jewish conspiracy. That didn't stop the biggest German bankers and industrialists from eventually coming in behind him. They needed a Hitler with all his violent and totalitarian methods to save their system of capitalism. 
Eventually, all he had to offer was a monstrous war that ended in smoldering ruins. Now, in Louisiana, Duke is trying to build a similar movement. And what is its objective? Not to help raise wages for all working people or guarantee their job security. It is to reverse the entire period of the last 40 to 50 years when gains have been made not only in civil rights, but in union organization, in women's rights, in education, and in social reforms generally. Many of these gains have been under attack since the late 1970s, but Duke wants to sweep them all away. One of David Duke's most vicious arguments concerns, of course, the question of welfare. He gives the impression that black people and other minorities consume a great portion of the state budget, and that if they were penalized, this would help reduce the budget. In one form or another, this same argument has been put forward in almost all the states. The more rabid politicians make it a principal point in their election campaigns, calling people on welfare freeloaders, parasites, and so forth. But who really gets welfare in this country? Who gets the billions and billions of government funds? Not poor people. The ones who devour huge sums from the federal and state budgets are the giant corporations. They've been living on welfare all their years of their existence. Almost all of them are subsidized in one form or another. During the Reagan years, their subsidies came in the form of huge reductions in taxes. It got so ridiculous that some giant oil companies paid less taxes than a working class family. In addition, they get special financial benefits through grants for research and development and other forms of hidden subsidies. This is particularly true for military contractors, especially those in aerospace. All this welfare for the rich corporations that run Louisiana. But has Duke ever told it like it is? Has he ever tried to mobilize the workers against these rich corporate criminals who thrive off government welfare? White workers and, and affirmative action. In addition to welfare, Duke harps on affirmative action. As he tells it, whites are being penalized because the, lo the law now requires that black and Latino workers who have faced past discrimination should be compensated affirm uh, affirmatively in promotions. There's no reason that affirmative action has to hurt white workers. The discrimination in the past was a result of the policy of the bosses. They instituted discrimination in the workplace and they should pay for it. Are there ways to erase ra racial discrimination in the workplace without taking out of the hides of white workers? Take the matter of promotions. Say a white male is entitled to a promotion from labor grade 2 to labor grade 3, but a black or woman worker with less seniority is now eligible for the job because of the new law on affirmative action. The worker who would have who would have gotten the job on the basis of seniority should also get an equivalent pay raise. That way the worker isn't penalized because of the past discriminatory practices of the company. There can be many other approaches to make sure that affirmative action does not hurt any workers. It is a pity that the labor movement has gradually acquiesced to a halfway measure regarding affirmative action, which puts the burden on the workers. It leaves the labor movement open to vicious racism. Extended jobless benefits. Duke doesn't address the question of why Louisiana pays so little in unemployment benefits when so many are out of work. Unemployment insurance isn't just a federal program like Social Security, it's a federal state system. Wouldn't this be an opportunity for Duke, if he really was for the workers, to demand a state extension of benefits? This is particularly important in a state like Louisiana, where the crisis has lasted so long that benefits have run out for hundreds of thousands. Living in Louisiana, you have seen periods of boom as well as bust, especially in the oil and gas industry. The boom periods made the powerful corporations much richer, more aggressive, and predatory. But have they left the workers any better off? Louisiana has the resources to be one of the most self-sufficient states in the Union. Instead, it has become more dependent 
on what is happening to the economy, not just nationally, but even globally. Why is that? If all the natural resources, <clears throat> if all the natural wealth of Louisiana were being utilized to provide for the needs of the residents of the state, there wouldn't be any problem. But that's not what's happening. Everything is produced in order to make a profit. When the profit system goes bust, the most significant section of the population, the workers, are left helpless. But the workers don't have to be helpless. We're the majority of the population. If we get together, we can be tremendously powerful. We have the ability to stop everything from moving, as can be seen in other countries when workers go out on a general strike. Certainly, the big bosses are aware of that and will do all they can to prevent the workers from getting any ideas. That can mean throwing their weight behind a dangerous, a demagogue like Duke in order to get him elected so he can channel everything into a racist struggle. What is needed in Louisiana, as elsewhere, is, to, is a change in the relationship between the working class and the capitalist class. It is necessary for the working class to take hold of all the natural resources and means of production and use them for the interests of society as a whole, not for a handful of millionaires and billionaires. Voting against Duke will, hel will help open the road to such a development. Yeah. To the masses. To the masses. So, do people want to react to that class? I guess conclude, you know, some discussion before we conclude this class. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Oh, the, the mic's coming. Hold on. Yeah, I really like this speech because it it doesn't have the same sort of like self-flagellating energy as the modern left. It's not like, oh, you should apologize for being white. You should accept that you have this original sin of whiteness and like you have to you have to uplift black voices and those black voices are just CEOs who happen to be black. It's really refreshing to see like that um, Sam Marcy is pointing out just like, yeah, like the racism coming from David Duke, like it harms both white people and black people by pitting workers against each other. Donald Trump was a lot less racist than David Duke, but there were a lot of people who said, if you even think about voting for Donald Trump, don't talk to me. You know, we can't be friends anymore. And so for, for Sam Marcy to say this to Duke supporters, I think is um, profound today. He did the exact opposite. He went out of his way to talk to them. I think the most important thing that Sam Marcy's doing here is to speak for the direct interests of the workers. Um, and when you can actually see what are people's needs and how can they be met, um, that's really the question that Marxists need to ask. Not what is the most moral position, how do we get a rhetorical edge on someone else. Maybe this is important in so on some level, but the interest of the working class as a whole is what we need to comprehend. I was actually just going to say that, you know, I've heard some Democrats occasionally make the point that, oh, well, you know, um, the Republicans, they just, you know, engage in this sorts of bigotry to divide you guys amongst each other, but they just kind of leave it at that. Uh, and the conclusion, obviously, is, well, just vote for us. Um, I like how in this, um, in this letter, uh, Sam Marcy really kind of goes into the in the in the depth about like the economic workings of it and how this works and uh, just kind of trust that you know the workers will understand this so i like that we're also going to have to approach uh where um um every um not so um even bigoted workers uh, who are and voters who um who are thinking about good um voting for Ron DeSantis, who is a possible uh, candidate for the Republican Party. And this is going to be a very similar situation with David Duke, because Ron DeSantis is, even though he is going against, you know, the uh, anti-wokeism, uh, anti and as we all know, wokeism is an ex another arm of, uh, of imperialism. He's not really doing this to be an anti-imperialist, but just, you know, trying to redirect um, um, anti um, the energy of anti-wokeism back to um, bigotry and and another um and just another arm of imperialism yeah.
And the point that Marcy is making in that letter, uh, and, and you're next, but the point that Marcy is making in that letter is that Duke's demagogy is about cutting the welfare state. And it's about, you know, rolling back affirmative action. And it's about, you know, stopping jobless benefits. It's about austerity. And that all workers would benefit from defeating David Duke. And that you have to oppose racism on a class basis. Go ahead. Uh, this just really brought me back to Robert's first presentation, uh, the first presentation yesterday about like human creativity and thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Like he just really, I think, brings up that you don't have to side with white workers against black workers, against with black workers against white workers. You can side with workers and have so many different solutions that don't harm either one. We just have to use our creativity, we have to think about it and not just accept the options that were given by capitalists. Right. right, and that's how they trap us, right? They give us the choice. Oh, you have to like Coke or Pepsi. You have to like mm -hmm. hamburger or Burger King. You know, Burger King or McDonald's, right? And that's the trap, right? And that, that by putting us in that trap, it prevents stuff like this from getting out there because this is what really threatens capitalist power. Anyone else want to make a comment about, not just the letter, but about any of the other stuff from the class? Um, I do, th I do think it's interesting how, uh, Workers World recruited from, like, SDS and worked with Weather Underground people, or maybe the, just the Weathermen, and, uh, I thought that was really interesting because a lot of the sort of movementists of today at PSL, DSA, are very content to work with anarchists who aren't honestly different than those groups were, but it, it is kind of interesting how that, that they're content to work with people who simply want to do action without like having a guiding ideology in order to sort of pump up their presence and do uh, protest for the sake of protest, you know? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Or, I mean, I, I, I would say that movementism is the biggest flaw in the Marcii tendency. There is this obsession with action and this belief that somehow the movement is where the hope is. Right? And that seems to be the belief. And that led them to support a movement against nuclear power that they knew was not correct because that's what the movement is doing. You know? And that, that led them in this orientation where they embedded themselves among this middle class elements. And they never were able to really build up a base among the working class. And then they ended up you know, just trying to take over the movement. Um, I guess maybe I should, I should quickly wrap up by talking about what happened. Um, you know, so Sam Marcy... After he died, the Workers' World Party, there were seven people in the Workers' World Party who became his successors. They became the secretariat of the Workers' World Party. Um, and they were elected on the day after his memorial. Uh, and uh, they proceeded to run the party. Uh, and then uh, the Iraq War protest movement started. Uh, and the Answer Coalition was launched by the Workers' World Party. Act Now, Stop War, and End Racism. And Brian Becker, Gloria LaRiva, uh, who's married to Richard Becker, Brian Becker's brother, uh, you know, Sarah Sloan and some others, uh, they, they ran the Answer Coalition. Um, and they were reserving the permits in Washington, D.C. for the protests and such. And they realized that they were not, uh, they were not as, uh, they, they, I guess they were better at it than the rest of the party was. And they were bringing in lots of money. And they felt like, why do we need to listen to this group? And so they resigned and they formed PSL. What's interesting is if you read their resignation letter, which has been leaked, right, and it took, took me years to get my hands on it, they say some true things. Um, one thing that they point out is that there was never really any democracy in the Workers' World Party. It was very much, uh, you know, the rule of one man. Um, and that, uh, that they created an atmosphere in the party where you weren't allowed to disagree. Uh, you know, if, if someone got up and said, I don't agree with this, they'd be taken aside later. Why would you do that uncomradely thing? Why would you, you disrespect the leader like that? I know that. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who's been in a Marciite formation has, has experienced that, uh, you know, and they create an atmosphere where even though, you know, it's on paper, everything's one person, one vote. If you vote wrong, uh, there's a problem uh, and every, every resolution is unanimous and, and, you know, and the internal meetings are just like the rallies they have publicly. It's just everyone just applauds and, you know, that's how they, how they work. And that was the atmosphere and that they felt they were better at running the answer coalition. So they walked away. Um, and then, uh, you know, the Detroit branch of the Workers' World Party has had a long rivalry with New York, uh, mainly because in the early 90s, when they were, the Workers' World Party was focused on building anti-war protests against the Gulf War, uh, they felt that it was better to run candidates for office in the name of socialism. 
So some people in New York City who were wanting power went to Sam Marcy and said, oh, Detroit is trying to undermine your leadership. So Sam Marcy went out to Detroit and gave a speech that was quite offensive to the Detroit membership. So the Detroit membership, to stick it to him, left him in his hotel for a day and didn't answer his phone calls, um, at which point, uh, you know, that was considered they disrespected Sam Marcy. So then the whole party was mobilized to have a national meeting to discuss Detroit, and Detroit was kind of put on punishment for the next several decades because they had disrespected the great leader, um, at, at which point... Uh, then, so after the PSL split uh, and PSL walked away, then at that point, Detroit was kind of elevated back into leadership because they felt that some of the people who had incited Sam Marcy against them were people that had left with PSL. So they were kind of elevated, um, but as things escalated, as the financial crisis continued, uh, the rivalry between Detroit and New York escalated, and someone who shall not be named, who was in the Communist Party and, and you know, did a lot to exacerbate disagreements, and ultimately Detroit was kicked out of the Workers' World Party in, in 2017. And then, I don't even know the details, and they're not important ultimately, there was something went on in Baltimore, there was, there was a sexual assault scandal that many felt was improperly handled, and there was a lot of allegations made, and I've heard so many different versions of the story, regardless, Baltimore, Baltimore walked away and Los Angeles walked away. And now the Workers' World Party, when I was in it, it was about 300 people. Now it's down to about 60, maybe. That's generous, maybe 30. You know what I mean? Uh, PSL is probably the most effective piece of Marcyite mechanisms. And, and if you look at PSL, they carry on this movementist approach. Whatever the movement's doing, that's where they're at, you know? Um, and that has led them to take some positions that are, that are pretty, you know, Debt, pretty opposite of our approach with Out of the Movement to the Masses. Maybe you want to talk about that some, Sam, because you, you have, you've spoken on that more eloquently. Like, what's PSL up to these days? Well, you know, uh, I'm trying to think what they, you know, I, I disagreed with them. They wanted to go uh, to protest Rittenhouse, for example. Mm. I said we should stay in our city, don't go to Kenosha, don't be at the Rittenhouse protest. There's going to be people fighting. And we also don't want to solidify our image. Oh, we're just radical Democrats. No. So, you know, I, I disagreed with us going there. But the thing is that Chicago was already mobilizing to go there before we even had a discussion, should we go or not. Chicago was already mobilizing to go there. And the slogans had already come down from National. So my disagreement was unwanted and it was not not an allowed disagreement because the decision had already been made mm -hmm. um and uh that's that's how it is the slogans come down from national yeah. they decide what we do what we say uh with abortion i said that we should not be at the front of the democrat run abortion protest we should not be um you know the outspoken radical voices in favor of an issue which is dividing the working class in this way and they disagreed with me vehemently. And later I learned the reason why is because National planned to do a long campaign on the issue of abortion, which has become their central issue for the last mm. several months. Oh my God. <laughs> and uh, go ahead, Elizabeth. And the thing with controversial issues such as abortion is like, they don't always have to be divisive, even though they are. Like, for example, let's say you got someone who's pro-life and pro-choice, for lack of better terms. Um, the pro-life person, very much against abortion, believes that life begins at, con at conception, conception and also sees abortion as a tool of class warfare, basically. Like, make the poor stop having so many babies. The pro-choice person sees, um, sees these anti-abortion laws as an attack on women's bodily autonomy, basically, like and unwanted pregnancies would end up forcing the woman and her baby into poverty, and that's also an aspect of class warfare. So, these two groups, very busy fighting each other. Um, one of them thinks the other's a baby killer, the other one thinks the other's a misogynist. However, you look at this and you think, how about we address the root causes of abortion? Why don't we give aid to mothers and children? Why don't we... Um, <laughs> Why don't we have free, universal, high-quality health care? And when you point that out, 
then you get these two very polarized sides to come together and see the primary contradiction. Yeah. Which is what they don't want us to do. And at the end of the day, PSL is Protest Incorporated. It's, it's, that's basically what they are, right? They are, a, they are a, a corporation that protests as a way to fund, fundraise and to bring people in. So the reason that they got all excited about Kyle Rittenhouse is that was all over CNN. That's what all the liberal people are doing. So that's what we're going to do, right? And the reason they got all excited about abortion is because that was all over CNN. That's what all the liberal people are doing. And that's what you're going to do, right? And that's great if you're just trying to raise money and run a protest hustle. But if your goal is to actually bring socialism to the United States, your job is not just to go along with what's happening. That's called tailism. Your job is to try and redirect things like Sam Marcy did. If Sam Marcy had just written a letter, David Duke is a racist, you're a disgusting person for supporting him, would that have been the correct approach? No. Our job as communists is to talk like Sam Marcy did in that letter and not to simply go with whatever the liberals are doing. And part of it, I think, at the end of the day, is simply just a matter of demographics, right? That Sam Marcy, not born in the United States, lived his whole life in New York City, and to some degree or other, as, as good as that letter is, he didn't quite understand that there are red states. And he, he couldn't understand why anyone, you know, in, in the, you know, you talk to these people in, in these organizations, They've never met anyone who's against abortion, a lot of them. They don't, they don't know what an anti- they, Maybe they've, they've met like an, a right-wing person with a fetus thing who's screaming, but, but in terms of like an average working-class person who lives in a red state and is against abortion, they have no idea what that's like. Or they're mad at their conservative parents who... Yeah. Or, or there's that, too, and that's, that's, that's a whole psychological thing we can get yeah. into. But, but there's like a lack of, of willing to understand this and that what the liberals are doing... And what we're doing are completely different, right? We, there may be some overlap. We're against racism. Liberals are against racism. Uh, we're against any form of oppression. Um, but now, especially around the anti-war thing, liberals are more pro-war than conservatives in a weird way. And, you know, and, and also if you talk about the things that leftists and communists have been talking about for years, like, you know, opposing, opposing wars about, you know, FBI political repression, I'm just waiting for the day one of these liberals tells me that COINTELPRO is a Trumper conspiracy. Because our, our good FBI would never do that. That must be, right, I'm just waiting for it, right? Our good FBI would never, never go after civil rights organizers. That's something the Russians made up to question, make you question our faith of our democratic institutions. That's the way it's getting. The, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, and that, that if we're going to actually see a real socialist movement in the United States, more than anything right now, we have to break with this polarization that the liberals and the conservatives are setting up. Ron DeSantis, they do the same thing. They're all about austerity, right? It's about driving down the living standards, right? It's about making the workers pay for the crisis that the capitalists created. That's what they want to do. And some of them want to do it one way, and some of them want to do it another way, but that's what they want, to make the workers pay for the crisis that they created. And our job is to bring forward a class-for-itself perspective, that it's the capitalists who created the crisis, and the workers shouldn't have to pay for it, and ultimately we ought to run the banks and factories and industries ourselves. And that's our line, and that's very different than what the Democrats are saying, very different than what the Trumpers and the Republicans are saying. It's the class line, and that's why the Center for Political Innovation and the kind of work we do is important. You know, We're not an activist group. We're an educational think tank. I hope you all go do great activism. We're not here to lead you in activism. We're here to put forward the class political line, the socialist, anti-imperialist perspective that is missing in these times. And I think that's how I'll end this class, and we can take a break, and then we can do our next one. <laughs>